five. Go live. Oh, this is, as I said, the awkward part. Here we go. concerned about our recon time and decided to look into reconditioning workflow software. After doing our research, I can confidently say we finally found the software that was right for us. We love that it packs robust data, control precision, clear communications, and performance accountability, all on my desktop or mobile, so I'm always in touch. Before this, we manually tracked our recon process. We just assumed we were doing okay. We were wrong. After someone in my 20 group told me he used the software to improve his recon time to sale to just three to five days, I just had to look into it. Their team of recon experts all have hands-on dealership experience. We all benefit from faster time to line, inventory turns, and competitive advantages. To learn more, visit rapidrecon.com. So go ahead, Jeff. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're listening to us from, watching us from. But to our guests here, we have good morning and uh, still good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, it's, uh, it's great to have everybody here on our uh, Maximizing Your Empty Lot show in 2022 show. 
show, 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 2022. Uh, Ian. So a few books, How to Sell 100 Cars a Month from Ali Rita and Damien Bordreau, Car Buying Online for Dummies, a reference for the rest of us, and Used Car Dealership Business Startup by Jack Porter. Go ahead with our disclaimer. And of course, uh, we uh, our disclaimer basically is, is the views and opinions shared today are those of our guests and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Auto Hub show or Ian Nethercott or Jeff Polo. And uh, in this world, it's a much a very important thing to have a disclaimer. Exactly. So we're going into maximize your empty lot in 2022. So let's get into it. So joining us today, we have a very eclectic uh, group of people, uh, which Bill Camastro mentioned a few minutes ago, heavy hitters. And we're always proud to have heavy hitters joining us today. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce everybody in order their appearance of logging on this morning. So first of all, we have Nick Patterson, who's the uh, CEO of VetX, uh, joining us from uh, Chico, California, I believe, Northern California somewhere. You can never trust uh, LinkedIn for correct uh, things. Uh, Nick, uh, say hi to everybody. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How's it going, everybody? Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, my family's been in the car business for over 50 plus years. Um, I built a software to help make myself more efficient at acquiring inventory through the private party market. Uh, four years later, we're a nationwide software company that helps dealerships manage all of those private party leads into one simple CRM for them to maximize the amount of purchases they can make, uh, ultimately increasing the amount of inventory that they have on the ground. Perfect. Thanks for taking the time and we appreciate you joining us as a a first time Auto Hub show guest. Next, we have again in order of appearance is Tim Jackson, uh, who's the president and CEO of the Colorado Dealers Association. And uh, we're really quite thrilled to have somebody from a, uh, an organization that is in between dealers and uh, the rest of the industry. And Tim joins us from Denver, Colorado, or roughly whereabouts. Tim, please say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, Ian and Jeff, and your illustrious uh, panel here. Uh, honored to be on with you. Uh, I've been with the Colorado New Car Dealer Association for 18 years, but I've been in and around the auto industry all my life. Um, my father-in-law was a Ford dealer, and I grew up in and around his uh, dealership um, as I was growing up. So i uh, love to get into the discussion here with you today. Uh, these are the what we could, I think, all agree, the best of times and the worst of times. The worst of times to have inventory to sell, but the best of times when you sell it, you make the most you've ever made. Dealer's profitability is the highest it's ever been, but the challenges um, are real and uh, the problem is real. And um, we really, um, consumers will be very challenged if this uh, inventory availability doesn't sort itself out over the next few months. Yeah, that's for darn sure. And it's, it's funny how we're all talking about shortage of inventory, but at the same time, profitability is, uh, is definitely a big, uh, big, uh, good thing, good thing. Next, joining us from the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, we have Troy Glenn, who uh, he's like, I don't know, a manager, a big shot with uh, CDK Global, who's trying to take over the world, hence the global. Troy, say hi, please. Hey. Hey everybody. Well, we have a lot. We have a lot of big shots in our company. I just happen to be a small version of that. Um, my name is Troy. I'm the uh, director of sales for Western Canada for CDK. Um, and you know, I guess for lack of a better introduction, my job is just to help dealers solve problems, really. And whether it's our software or something else, it's really, to, you know, to Tim's point, unprecedented times for all of us right now. So it's been fun. Great. Well, we appreciate you. We, we appreciate you being a fan of the show, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time this morning to join us. And um, it's very funny, you know. We did a show from NADA not long ago, uh, a couple of weeks, I guess now. And uh, the big thing that came about was uh, everybody's talking about the fact that if theirs doesn't do it, hopefully there's somebody else there that does it. And in the end, everybody supports themselves. By supporting others so it's great uh finally we have uh, as a scheduled guest joining us actually if we we just discovered from myrtle beach north carolina i'm sorry you had to be there i hear that it really sucks uh, uh, nowhere near as good as being back home in the gold coast in new jersey is uh, bill camastro who's the dealer of gold coast cadillac speaking of profit wow um 
Bill, say hi and uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, my, uh, so I'm Bill Camastro, and yeah, these, um, I'm in uh, I'm in North Carolina on the ocean right now, and uh, just moving into a, a sick my my wife into a, our second home. Appreciate you putting up with my my attire here, um, and uh, you know, just I just want to touch on this the fellow from CDK. We're going to CDK just as a just as an example, but uh, and I'm not and I don't want to. Um, I don't want to rain on everybody's parade. Software can only take us so far, you know, people and people making decisions are what's going to get us through this difficult time that we're in right now. I mean, having the right software and having the right technology that helps us identify the right paths to take, you know, it's great in real time analysis is important, but uh, you know, right now it's going to be about, it's going to be about people in, in process because technology is not going to get people to say, yes, I'll sell you my car. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the people who have taken the time to join us live here, which is uh, John Laka, our old friend from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, Larry Feldman, who we are taking on muting his mic at any time. <laughs> from Philly. Um, yeah, what's, and then we have Sean idea? Hopper here. And uh, John Ellis. Uh, Winraj, I'm not sure where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for taking time. And John Ellis is trying to figure out what's going on. But we'll just get right into it right now and uh, start with our our first uh, question. Ian. Uh, what the what the bleep? Nearly every dealership has an empty lot today. We know why, but how do we let them get that way? I mean, it's surprising when you drive around and look at dealerships where there's not only no cars, the cars they do have in the showroom have sold signs in them. So how do, how do we let it get that way? So let's start with uh, Tim Jackson on that one. Sure. Well, you know, inventory is a real problem. And... Uh... One, one uh, bit of evidence, I had driving by one of the Carvana vending machine towers and the tower is empty. So that really told the story on inventory problems for um, used car dealerships and, and the industry in general. Um, you know, um, typically on the new car side, we have dealers that would, tip, uh, would normally have anywhere from 12 to 1400 new cars on the ground at a uh, Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram store or a Toyota store just down the street that would normally have uh, eight or 900 new cars on the ground. And um, now their new car inventory on that, on that Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram is uh, only at 30 or below. And the Toyota store as of last week was at four new cars. So when the new car inventory is low, uh, the used car inventory is going to be in much higher demand because if the new car customer can't buy the new car or truck they want or need. They're going to migrate over to that used car lot. And, um, and so that's caused pressure there. Uh, so what it, it's really incumbent upon um, dealers, I think, to, to figure out those um, processes and systems whereby they have uh, more sources for the used car inventory. I mean, it's maybe stating the obvious right now, but, but those who figure out how to find used cars in the marketplace. Um, maybe it's the service drive, maybe it's just on trades, maybe it's from the auctions, the, all traditional methods. But now I think we have to, our dealers have to find ways to make the systems on their websites as um, uh, consumer friendly and user, user interface friendly as possible so they can buy used cars directly off the street. And, um, and replenish the inventory. That's, um, it's not just um, it, that it needs to be done, it really has to be done to remain competitive. Thanks for that. Uh, Bill, what do you think? Well, um, you know, going, going back to what uh, Tim had to say, I mean, you know, we, the, the problem is big and for a lot of reasons. One, there's no used car factory, right? So it's not, we can't, no matter how many chips we make, we're not going to make any more used cars other than what's owned by the, by the, by the people that are in the market driving. Them. So that's, that's a, that's a big problem. And, you know, for, to the new car dealer, you know, you, new cars are your best source of inventory that you own. Right. Right. So buying them off the street, buying them over the curb, especially with today's, you know, I, I, I myself, as a lot of you recognized, six months or a year ago when the press and TV started started hammering away at used car values being 40% more than they've ever been and you buy used cars too much money, blah, blah, blah. It didn't take long for the public to wake up and realize, okay, well then I can sell my car for 40% more as well, and which has put us in the situation we're in. 
right now, I, I, you know, and I, again, technology helps us identify opportunities and we need that. But more than ever before, you know, make sure my suggestion is make sure that you're using your CRM, make sure you have a good data mining tool and, for, and make sure if you can, you have you know, your own instant cash offer with every tool that's available to you with KBB. But more importantly, use every tool to stay top of mind for the customer. We have to stay top of mind. We can't touch it in a nice way and maybe in a soft way at times. We need to touch that customer as often as possible, even if it's to say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, whatever it is, we need to be top of mind. Relationship building, this is, it's ironic because the, our world has gone so tech savvy and digitally savvy and it's all about you know, digital retailing. Right now, if you focused on our good old fashioned values of agent relationship with customers, when the time came to actually them take advantage of selling their car, they might call you and say, Hey, Bob, you know what? I was thinking about selling. Like, we need to be in that space more than ever before. More than ever before, we need to be in that space where a customer will actually let us know that, hey, I'm, I'm interested. I'm thinking about selling my vehicle and, and tell the customer, listen, whether you sell the car to me or you sell it to somebody else, bring it down or let me take a look at it. I'll put a number on it. And if you don't sell it to me now in the back of our minds, we're thinking, OK, I'm going to I'm going to take my best shot on this car. But at, at our store, it, we're, we're putting a letter in every customer's vehicle. We tape it right to the, to the uh, dashboard that says we give you a, a, a no charge appraisal. We'd like to offer to buy your car as well. We don't talk about selling them a vehicle. We only talk about buying their car. Because if you talk about selling them a vehicle, they'll think it's an old fashioned horse trade. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm with Tim on this. We got to look at every opportunity available to us. But, but don't kid yourselves. I mean, we can maximize whatever bad is, whatever the bad situation is, we can maximize whatever our best potential is in that space, but there is no used car factory. So the comp competition to stay top of mind for the customer on your frontline people is greater than ever before. And I would suggest use your CRM, use your whatever data mining tool you have to identify everybody you can. We send out an e-blast at the beginning of every single month that we're offering X amount over, over KBB for, your, for to everybody in our database. And we offer a referral program as well to our own customer base to refer somebody who will sell us their car as well. So we can, you know, we can reach two levels down. So hopefully that's helpful. It's not gonna solve the world, but hopefully that my commentary is helpful. Thanks very hey, much. Bill, can I, can I build on what you and Tim said? Um, I, I had a dealer that, came to me and said, Larry, do you have any suggestions? Because he's like a lot of guys banging his head on the wall. And I, I kind of like exactly what you and Tim said, and maybe even take it a step further. Uh, to me, the key to a successful salesperson is a prospector, a guy that's not waiting for business to walk in, but drumming it up. And we all know every salesperson on earth works their pay plan, right? If, if you tell them, hey, we need more of this or that sold, that's what they sell if you incentivize them. Uh, on top of the CRM and everything else, what's wrong with talking in sales meetings about how important it is to get people that, to want to sell us their cars and maybe even incentivizing uh, the salespeople? Hey, if you can get somebody's trade in, is it, is it wrong to throw somebody 50 or 100? And, and everybody in this panel knows salespeople are strange creatures. They'd rather have $50 in their hand than $200 in their check. I'm not quite sure we have time to discuss the psychology of it. But I think if we can make salespeople understand how important it is to get these vehicles in so they have something to sell and, and a place to go to work, I, I just don't think it can hurt. Great, great comment. Nick, what do you think? You know, uh, yeah, I mean, Larry, correct. Uh, Bill, I think you made some really great points. You know, uh, process is everything. And, you know, one of the things when you're reaching out to the uh, private party sector, these people selling their vehicles, um, really just what you're doing is you're getting your name out there. You're telling them that you are different than, uh, what they're expecting the dealers to, to say, which is, you know, we're going to take advantage or get your car for less money. We're, we're different than that. We're going to take care of you. We're going to be fair on the valuations. And, um, the more and more that you're reaching out to the, the people that are in your backyard and you're explaining that you're different, uh, adds a lot of value long-term as well as short term. Cool. Troy, what do you think? You know, it's funny. It wasn't that long. Like, just to echo what Bill was saying, it wasn't that long ago when we were telling Greenpeas to go into the service drive, right? 
and every vehicle that came in for an appointment to do that turnover. Hey, we'll give you a trade on your vehicle so that you can uh, um, get into a new one for the price of your old one. Or if there's a $1,500, $2,000 RO there, that was sort of a sales kicker. And to your point, it's almost spun in the other direction now where we want to buy your car, not necessarily for the purpose of selling you a new one. That would be great because we need to buy the other one. Um, it is interesting that subtle little change of attitude has really been prevalent in my group. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing that dealers haven't done in the past, sort of go back to the, the question here, is they've got a pretty narrow view. If you're a new car dealer, you don't want anything on your lot that's more than four or five years old, unless it's a high line, pristine, super low mileage version of what you sell. And I've got a really successful dealer in the interior of British Columbia who's got a whole row of cars, probably dozens, that are and a big sign with arrows pointing down saying cars under 10 grand. And yes, he's a new Chevy dealer. He sells a lot of great new Chevy cars. But for that first car buyer, that kid who's 17, 18 years old, or someone who's credit uh, damaged that needs to get back into it, they found a whole new market for it. And he said he has better turn rate on those under $10,000 cars than anything else. So normally when you get that trade in on a, you know, high mileage caravan or, or so super small subcompact, they would fire those off to auction. Well, these guys are keeping it, turning it into a real revenue stream form and getting them into new cars down the road. It's just getting creative with, with the way you get in it, uh, get these new customers in. And like Nick was saying, it, it's really um, a matter of reaching out to your network, regardless of what vehicle they have, treating them like a VIP and, and turning it into something. And Hey, even if you did turn it into auction money, sometimes those auction dollars are proving out better than selling a vehicle anyway. Yeah, well, that's very, very true, Troy. I mean, I watch uh, the auctions literally every single day and it, it, it boggles my mind because I'm seeing a lot of dealers still selling off the cheap cars, but now you're getting, and of course, uh, you know, Nick, you're connected with the Tim, of course, and, and Bill, um, you're seeing all this new stuff or nearly new 2021 Tacomas. You know, I bet you every, every week on each of the platforms I watch, which is four, there's between two and 10, 2020, 2021 Tacomas. And they're going for way over MSRP. And mind you, in Canada, we have, do have the challenge of the U.S. being 20%, the dollar being 20% more and the vehicle selling for the same amount of money in U.S. dollars. Nevertheless, we, we, uh, we have no way to control the shortages and OEM supply, but what can we do to present a positive image, images to the customers and staff? And because it's now becoming a, it's almost becoming a news story about the shortage of new cars. And you turn on the TV, you see the ads, which say, we're going to give you another thousand bucks if you put your factory order in so you can order the exact car you want and wait until someday. Um, how do we present that positive image to our customers in front, literally, physically, and virtually, short of posting stock images of cars? And actually, I'm going to go to Tim, uh, to Nick. Sorry, Nick, because you've had the least chance to speak here. Um, what do you think? Because you're actually from a position of a vendor, and also the family has, uh, you know, is in the retail business too. Nick. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm trying to uh, think of uh, uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Very good question. You know, I think uh, I've been having talks with, uh, you know, GMs of, uh, you know, regions and Toyota corporate and the change that they're structuring things and looking at it from different angles. And, um, and yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't, I don't have a definitive answer at this point, I don't think, in regards to that. It's a tough one. Yeah, no, and I'm sorry to, 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 to spring it on you there. It's just I remember you did, You only got to say a little bit. But, you know, my, my plan was for today's show to go out and take a bunch of pictures. And I always love to rag on a few dealers here because they just don't seem to get it. They'd rather leave their cars parked in the back and show empty lots than find a way to fill it. But uh, I figured I didn't want to get hit with a cease and desist letter for promote <laughs> ragging on them. But uh, Tim, so you 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 have a whole bunch of dealers that you talk to. I'm sure about this all the time. What can we do? How do we present a, a better image, uh, physically and virtually, other than empty lots? No, it's an excellent question, and one of the big uh, subject matters in the public media now is is um, 
these ADMs. So um, that's the um, the acronym for added dealer markup. And obviously those are not popular and, and uh, um, for all the, all the reasons that uh, you'd expect them not to be popular. But we get a lot of calls and I interact with a lot of consumers and the general media. And um, one thing that I think um, needs to be stated in, in the lead in video today was um, even though from Great Britain was really spot on. And by the way, even pre-pandemic and pre-inventory uh, shortage was and was ultimately spot on for today's market. And that is that the new car, I mean, that the uh, the car customer is probably better if they're looking at the late model product is probably better still in the new car market than they are in the late model used car market. Um, we we hear, and, and I know you, everybody on the, show today has, has heard um, the, of, the, of these late model cars that were a year or two old bringing more than MSRP. So if a consumer is going to have to pay more than MSRP for a one or two year old car with miles on it and somebody having um, driven it uh, for a year or two, wouldn't they be better off with that, with the new, uh, with that car as a, as a new car? We know that they would be and, and uh, so now we, we, we have to find a way to acclimate the, the car customer into um, uh, shopping for that new car. It's going to do two things. It's going to get, make them happier at a better price point. And it's also going to hopefully if they have a, a trade or um, something to take out of their driveway, it's going to help replenish the used car lot. Um, I'm always driven by data. And on, on this subject, I'm driven by JD Power pin data. And um, you all may be aware that pre-pandemic and pre-inventory shortage, that 91% of the vehicles sold for less than, um, or uh, yeah, 91% of the vehicles sold for less than MSRP. Actually, I'm, I'm getting these turned around. 98% sold less than MS, MSRP. Today, if you look at all the cars bought, and this is JD Power pin data um, on over five million transactions. Um, the average price point is still under MSRP. That's pretty amazing when you hear so much talk about about uh, ADMs. And th the reason for this is that um, there's still a lot of dealers that will sell at or below um, MSRP. In fact, 90% of the transactions today are sold at or, M or below MSRP. So, so it is, uh, you could say, the best kept secret out there. And I think uh, we do need to find a better way to tell that story and to uh, convince customers that the new car is, uh, if they're in the late model market, uh, the new car is probably the mo more efficient way to go. Bill, and, uh, or uh, I, I'd be curious from a, a dealer standpoint, you know, we, uh, you know, when I was on the dealer side, you want to be able to create a relationship with your, uh, the person that you sell the vehicle to, and then you want to be able to sell it to them every three years. So that three-year-old car, two-year-old car now is, uh, worth more than the new car that puts the dealer in a kind of an interesting predicament, wouldn't you say? That's a very good point. Um, and, and look, I, I know this is kind of a, this kind of a dark, kind of a dark secret, but it's kind of a reality. If you charge, not, not that I'm suggesting to do this, but if you charge a customer a premium and it comes time to sell their car, they're definitely coming back to you without question. They're definitely coming back to you. So that doesn't that part of it doesn't worry me as much it doesn't worry me as much um my you know one of the things that we really focus on and, and i and i look i'm we're not i'm not saying we're the best dealer on the planet we're pretty good at what we do we're, in fact we're really good at what we do and they're better than us but i i i keep to me if i my customer attention long term and my customer attention trends and my likely to recommend scores, my, my overall satisfaction scores remain at or above the region and significantly so consistently throughout the trend or throughout this period of time. That to me is my best barometer. Now, candidly, 
you know, we have, we, we, we do sell, we, we sell Escalades. Okay. And many, so if you got, if you, if you guys know the Escalade market, um, there's a feeding frenzy out there because candidly wholesalers would, would come into your store, buy an Escalade for MSRP or 5,000 over and take it the next day to the auction and sell it for 20 grand. Over. So while that's going on, I'm certainly not going to let that happen. And, you know, I, I will tell you whenever we get an issue from our customers or any pushback whatsoever, I deal with the customer myself, you know, for the, for the, for the 30 or 40 cars that are sold in my market, because most of the dealers in my market are 10, 15, 20 grand over on Escalades. And it's, we sell everything else at MSRP, but the Escalades, we do compete in that space. I deal with the customers directly. They have my personal cell phone number. And if I, if there's any movement off that, that additional markup, it comes from me because I want to know, I want to stay close to it. Is it a customer that's been servicing the cart with me forever? Do they live right around the corner? Or is this a guy that lives out in Idaho, you know, with a, with a, with a shell company that's going to ship the car someplace else? I want to know that. And in this market right now, I, I mean, and this is just me speaking. I mean, maybe I do things differently. It doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. I think right to the top of the food chain, you have to stay that close to your business if you're that concerned with your customers. Um, my, the old adage I try to live by is the further you get away from selling cars, the further, the further you get, the closer you get to losing your business. And I stay very, very close to it. I get, you know, I'll get two or three calls a day from customers. We sell a lot of cars in every store, but uh, we, I get calls every day from customers saying, you know, your guy's telling me this, what should I do? And, you know, I explain the market and I tell them, look, I have a car that nobody else has. Do your shopping. I'll put your name on it. Let me know what you find. I know my market. I mean, I know what they're going to find when they go out there. Um, and they, you know, again, it's all about the agent relationship with the customer. I, I'd like to say it's more fancy and more, compli more complex than that. It really isn't at the so, end so of going, the day. Going back to that whole, uh, you know, these cars that are two years old are now going for more than what MSRP is on a new one. You know, it's super right. interesting to me, right? And I think all of us. Um, I've already seen a big shift in CJDR uh, in regards to their MSRPs, you know. Uh, but, but, think, but think about it for a moment. Your customers come in. They want to sell you their car at four grand over what they would have gotten two years ago. Exactly, and, and they and they want to bitch about buying your car at over MSRP. So no, yeah, that's but, where, that, but the, the that's same, where you got to stay. That same MSRP on that same car uh, that's one year old that that would be still brand new is is right. like gone up significantly, right. Uh, right. you know, by thousands and thousands of dollars. So I've already right. seen the the manufacturers making their adjustments in regards to this, right? Um, and new car, you know. Uh, Gosh, uh, Jeep, uh, Grand Cherokees are crazy expensive now. Wranglers are crazy expensive. Yeah, you know, and your, sa your salespeople, your salespeople. I'm going to tell you flat out, and I know no one's going to like the sound of this because we all spent 20, 30, 40 years in the business to get to that place where we don't have to deal with every single customer every day. But I'm going to tell you this: the guys at the top of the food chain, the managers at the top of the food chain. If you think your salespeople are going to be able to handle this banter with a customer, you're out of your mind. They're not going to be able to handle it. They're going to, they're going to get you in trouble. They're going to say things they shouldn't say because they don't know what to say because the customers ask them those questions and the customers walk in with, you know, offers from other dealers at four grand or over MSRP for a car they bought two years ago. And now you're trying to sell a car and they want to buy your car for MSRP. Other, uh, otherwise you're a thief, but they want market value, which is four grand more than that car is worth. So there has to be a, a grassroots, Okay, let's go on the computer together. Let's look at the market on your car. Let's call a few dealers together and pose as a customer and see what they tell me with you present. You've got to be prepared to do that. Otherwise, you're going to, you're going to take it on the chin from today's customer. A very, uh, it's a very interesting discussion on this. And the, the topic of over MSRP is uh, will go on and on and on. Uh, but Bill, you made a very interesting point. And I, I, I know Troy wants to weigh in on this, but it's a very interesting point. Um, even in the U.S., which us in Canada think, wow, they're getting so much money for the car, it's still one of the lowest priced markets out there for new vehicles. And a person, you know, we have a lot of it here in Canada where, where they will get somebody to come in that their circumstances mean they don't pay taxes. They'll buy, uh, 
they'll buy a warranty, they'll uh, buy ProPack, they'll buy etching and tire protection and everything. And then they take the car, take it to the port, it gets shipped overseas and they just cancel everything right away anyway. So the dealer's having trouble with that. But, uh, you know, I can see the justification for going over MSRP and especially on premium vehicles. Um, Troy, what's your opinion on this? Well, I mean, there's, it's all about supply and demand anyway. And Bill sort of started talking about this and then, um, he mentioned it also in the last show that we were on together. It's not about, I mean, okay, well, let me just reframe. Jeff, I needed a car. What did I do? I went and asked you. I said, my kid needs a car. Can you help me out? And you, what did you say? You said, look at my website and what, I, what else, if I don't see a car there, you'll help me find one. And really, I think that's what it boils down to is, you know, Bill's creative um, bridging people while they're waiting for a special order vehicle to come in bridging them into a pre-owned vehicle in the short term, um, finding people who have uh, another way to help you find a car, sit down with them, call a couple of dealers, be that consultant. And it's not about selling a car or buying a car anymore. It's about, you know, being that partner. And if dealers, if we go back to the old stat we used to beat to death, which is dealers would go to three dealerships before deciding, then it was 1.6 then 1.2. Now it's pretty much one point whatever. Um, you want to keep them in there. And right now with an inventory shortage, that number is going back up. If you can sit down and say, if I can't sell you a car that I have on my lot today, what do you need? Maybe I can get it at auction. You're watching four auction platforms right now, Jeff, as an example. Um, let's partner on this together. And, you know, the other thing is, as Bill said, educate the customer as to what's going on. A lot of customers don't, they think, yeah, okay, I can sell my car for a lot of money because, the newspaper told me so, or the news told me so, but we have to talk about why and educate them as to what's going on and say, you know, we're still going to make, we've got our, the price we're going to sell you a vehicle for the price we're going to pay for your vehicle. There's a profit margin that's in there that we need to, in order to maintain this business. It's not me taking a huge uh, commission off to all my guys. We're not, you know, rolling in dough or anything like that. But if I overpay for your trade, I'm going to sell you at MSRP because my cushion's not moving anywhere. And as soon as we tell everybody how the car business works, they sort of settle back down a little bit, cooler heads prevail. I get asked probably once a week for someone to help me or help them buy a car. Who, which dealer should I go to? Who should I trust? What should I ask for? And the first thing we do is we go value their trade online. We look at similar vehicles and see what they're, what they're selling for in a dealership. And then I explain what the recon cost is going to be and then what you should expect to get. And, and really it's, it's about, sitting down with your customer, educate them as to what's going on. And if someone walks in with unreal, unrealistic expectations and they're not a service customer of yours and they're not loyal, maybe they're just not your customer. And that's okay. And, and Troy, can I, can I build again on, on what you're saying and what Bill said with Bill and I, uh, even though I'm a little crazier than him, uh, feel the exact same way about getting in touch with the customer. Bill, we sold our store in 2012 I'm still selling five to seven cars a month because people will not make a move unless I, I meet them at a dealer or call a dealer. Uh, right. as, far as, what, as far as what you said, Troy, l listen, it's a little crazy how all I ever hear is that, well, how do we put a positive spin on the fact that nobody has any cars? The same damn way we put a spin on when everybody had too many cars and they were fighting below invoice. Here's what you say to your customers, in my humble opinion, even though... Uh, Jeff and Ian will tell you I don't have a humble book bone in my body. Okay. <laughs> Troy, Troy, I'm glad you're here. Okay. Um, you have never had a better time in your life to sell your car. And by the way, all the stuff you see on the news, get the elephant out of them. All the stuff you see in your news, dealers are hitting people high, but I'm going to get you the best possible deal. And the thing that perked my ears up is you said when you when you call somebody, they say go to the website. Take the website and throw it out the window. You know what I say to people when they call me? Hey, give me a minute. Let me write down what do you think they want or they don't. Because as soon as we get let the tech overwhelm our humanity, we're dead to the world. Here's the beauty I tell people when I train them and when I, I get dealers to hire me. Nobody has any cars. It's a round ball. So now more than ever, it's important to be a human being, to answer your phone. Um, Jeff and Ian, can I backtrack? Is it okay? I, I, tuned, I love Jeff and Ian. 
They've been really good to me. They've put me in contact with people. They let me use John Locke as therapist, so it's my whole demeanor thing. Um, they got me on a show. Guy, Gentlemen, I'd like to present you to the Larry Feldman Show. Well, I'll, I'll let you guys have top billing. I, Come out straight to the back up a little just, bit. Just, no, no, no. In here. Larry, no, no, this you're not is... using my therapist. I am your therapist. <laughs> that means you're responsible for this. I think Camastro wants you to move a box down for him and not be associated. So I get on a show two weeks ago with Jeff and Ian, who I'm huge fans of. Told you, Nick. Okay, wait, wait, wait. This gets better. And they had three of the most brilliant people I've ever heard in my life talking about technical shit that if you paid me a million dollars, I couldn't understand. <laughs> and it was, it was, it, it was elucidating, illuminating, and it was boring as hell. And I came in off a sales call and I jumped in, I told about 10 jokes and I made fun of everybody. Ian and Jeff are my lion. Both people I tortured reached out and said, we love this guy, can we connect? That's, the tech is great. The data is great. You can't live your life without it. Bill and I know how to read a statement backwards, but you still have to be a human. Hey, don't worry, man. What a great, and, and, to, and you also said, Troy, again, I am listening. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that we told people to go to service. Yeah, it was yesterday, because that's when I was at a dealership and told them to get their ass in service. They're your customers. And, and buy the service advisors donuts and pizza because it's great when they call you and say, the guy's got 200,000 miles. This thing's going to mm -hmm. blow over, okay? We're going to survive Trudeau and Biden, hard as it is to believe, and we're going to roll. But we're going to do it by having a plan and a positive attitude. Mr. Locke, is that okay? Are the meds working? <laughs> meds are working. We, we do have right. the books on the time for the shock therapy, okay? I don't <laughs> <laughs> Larry, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you you ought to pick up your enthusiasm a little bit. <laughs> well, Larry, Larry, I want to buy whatever you're selling, buddy. Where do I send the paperwork? Well, Nick, Bill, it just, the it just seems you, that the meds are working. You made the mistake of asking a salesman, what does he sell? Because I believe you have to let everybody know who you are, what you do, and where you do it. I'm Larry Feldman. I, I am the world's greatest trainer and recruiter. Um, no disrespect to Mr. Locke. Uh, outside of the, his province. Barry, okay. that's 50 bucks. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for Troy to do the conversion from American to Canadian. We'll get to you, bums, okay? 300 it's Canadian. About, it's about 800 bucks. <laughs> and I wrote a book on Nick called Inner Moron Demons, How to Avoid Them and How to anyway, Live Your Best Life. Anyway, moving right along, Tim, you were going to say something. Go well, I was just going to say that uh, I agree uh, totally with what Bill uh, said earlier about uh, him stepping in because the salesperson is not going to know yep. how to handle these uh, tougher questions. And when you have a general manager or an owner like that, uh, that's exactly what needs to happen. And Larry said, hit on that too. Um, and I couldn't agree any more with both of them. They are spot on on that. And uh, what we need in the industry really and, and in the dealership world is more of that. You need uh, the hands-on leadership especially in the tough times. If it's if in normal times, uh, you, your normal salespeople will, will get it from start to finish and not have a problem. But these, I think we can all agree, are not normal times. And the fact that Bill will uh, answer a customer and uh, respond to them, take their calls and work them through the issue. Uh, we need more of that. I, I applaud that. And Larry hit on a little bit of that too, because I know he's very hands-on. <laughs> can, I be, can, I, can be careful. You just you just endorsed me and Bill in the same statement. That's like endorsing yeah. Gandhi and Idi Amin. Yeah. <laughs> I, let, I just want to I want to jump in for a second because I want to I want to just kind of jump back on what, what Tim had said. Yeah. I, I just want to point out two very important things that I've that I've come to realize over the last 10, 15 years of all the like the uh, the the rocket ship known as digital technology. You know, so many of the applications and, and you know, widgets that have been invented, everything that we do, right, is so in an iPad or in one of these, okay? The, it, one, one of the things that even the people on this phone call, including myself, we can forget a lot of times is we're not the end user most of the time. The end user most of the time is somebody much further down the food chain. I don't mean that in a disparaging way. But it could be a 23-year-old kid or, or a 28-year-old young lady that, you know, doesn't have our acumen, hasn't talked to 40,000 people, hasn't been told F you to their face enough times to understand how to deal with it. You know, it, it, you know in our, in, when I grew up in the car business, 
they, what I was told on the, from the, on the way in, you're not in the car business until, until you've been told F you to your face and you, and you sold the customer a car. So my, my point in that is, you know, all the great technologies and great ideas we have, when the day comes to an end, if we're not, if our ground floor people aren't able to, you know, sell or communicate the way a Larry might communicate or, or the way Tim might communicate or Ian or any of us, right? We've got to remember that they don't, they, they're not 30 and 40 year veterans. They're not, they don't have the boat. They don't have the second home. They're trying to get all those things. They just don't know how to get there. So that communication by example, you know, as a, 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 a child between the age of zero, a first born and seven years old has the greatest accumulation of knowledge from the day, from any other time in their lives, because they watch their mother's facial expressions. They watch how the words sound. And they emulate everything that they see. You got to look at your 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 ground floor people the same way when they come in the car business. And if they're not, they don't have something to emulate. They're going to fall back on all of whatever their personal defaults are and whatever their personal experience in life ha have been. And they're going to say things that get us in trouble, or they're going to rely solely on the technology. Right? How many applications have you guys had over the years? that your general sales manager came up to you in three months and said, this thing doesn't work. Let's get rid of it. We're paying too much money for it. Right. Because we didn't invest ourselves in it. And, 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 you know, if I understand a, an application or a product better than my people and I can apply it and I can role play it and sit with customers and TO deals for them. I don't listen. I don't feel like doing that every day of my life, but I want to make sure that I, I do do it. Even if I fail so that the example they get is the effort not just the success of the effort, the 100% effort that relates to the 30 or 40% close rates that we seek. Because if we don't do that, they're going to always tell us, well, the technology sucks. I don't like what my desk is. My girlfriend gave me a hard time. You know, you have to understand I'm going through a divorce. They're going to go, all those things are going to keep coming up just like they did 40 and 50 years ago. And the, and the other thing, point I wanted to make was, you see, this is, this is in case anybody doesn't know, this is an iPhone. This thing right here, if I lost this today, I would feel like I lost, my family got killed in a plane crash. Okay, that's how lost I would be. Because my whole world goes through this thing. Every customer who's ever communicated with me, ever, since I got one of these things, I don't know how many years ago, I may, when they talk to me, I tell them, store my name right now while, you, while we're on the phone. If you want, I'll me the, send you the contact information. If you don't know how to do it, I'm sending it to you right now. When it hits your phone, just hit the button that says create new contact and done. And what happened, and I do the same thing with them. So what ends up happening is every customer who's ever bought a car from me, what's human nature? Human nature is when they try, okay, the day comes, they want to sell their car or buy a car. What's the first thing they think of, right? Like we all do, they auto search. They go in and they type something into their, their cell phone and what comes up? Bill Camastro, owner, car dealership, and they call me. So I, I will use every tool known to man to stay top of mind to every person I come in contact with as long as I walk this earth. And if I, if you can get your people to do that, you, you will not have to worry about how you sell cars in any market, anytime, anywhere, because whatever the best is under the circumstances you will accomplish. That's, that's, that's how I feel. So I, I it doesn't mean I know everything. I'm just, this is one of the things that's helped me stay ahead of the fray. And for the rest of it, I just hang around guys like Ian and Jeff because I get to hear all the shit I don't know and by hanging around guys like you. And well, anyway, hey, Bill, one thing I'll say, oh, I was going to say, first of all, as the guy who sells all the apps and widgets um, to all these dealers, first of all, I will say that you're right 100%. If it's not being adopted and embraced and trained by guys like you know Larry and John, it's not going to get used. And it doesn't matter. The technology at the end of the day doesn't matter if you don't have that human element. But I will also say, and I'm going to append to that, you're not a DMS salesman until you've been told to F you by a dealer, and then you sell them a DMS. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. By the way, tell Bill, tell Bill Madden I said hello. He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> I will. Nick, you had some thoughts there. Uh, you know, I, look, uh, the, the goal of technology is, is to make everyone's life easier and more efficient. And if it's not doing that, then the technology was built wrong. Hmm. You know, you live on that iPhone because they did a really good job making it so s seamlessly smooth that when you turn it on, you already know how to use it. 100%. Tim, you had some thoughts? 
No, I think this is all good discussion. Uh, the uh, one thing I wondered about is if anybody has ideas, it's been mentioned a time or two about um, selling in the service drive and really in this case, buying in the service drive, buying that um, late model used car that's in for service. And I think uh, dealers could do a better job in training the service riders and not necessarily to how to buy the car, but how to redirect the customer uh, potentially so the car gets bought. And I'd be interested in uh, others' thoughts on that. Tim, it's, it's the oldest thing and, and it's the best thing. They're called sales service meetings. You get everybody in the same room. You explain that your, your purpose is the same. The you know, old adage, uh, sales sells the first car, service sells the next one. How important it is to keep the ball rolling. But it's, it's really just about communication. And to Bill's point and to, and to Nick's point, as great as technology is, is there anybody you ever met in your life that doesn't hate when you call somebody with a small problem or question, you get 19 prompts and then they hang up on you. So once again, it's just important to be human. Uh, I, I always say that if you, if you have a dog and you point, your dog never looks where you're pointing, he looks at your finger. So we got to make sure everybody knows the direction because other than Bill's store, and I know Bill well, all kidding aside, I've been in a ton of stores. I'm all over the country where nobody knows what anybody's doing. It, it, it's just, it's frightening. So if you're not communicating with all the devices we have to communicate, how sad is that? Yeah, and you might also want to take a look at a store. I had the pleasure of doing some trading in uh, years ago now. It's in uh, near Nike's headquarters in Oregon. It's in Beaverton, Oregon. It's Beaverton Toyota. They have a dedicated office in their service drive basically to talk to customers about how can we buy your car? How can we put you into another car? They have a dedicated person as their own office right in the drive. That's all they do. And, and it's, it's, they have a massive service business, I think 450 ROs per day, uh, and they have a massive service team, but more importantly, they have a process, their sales process, their conversion process, their, it, and it's very well orchestrated machine. Tim, I, Bill, it's Bill again. I just want to mention one thing that a good tool for acquiring used cars through the service lane, the, the advisor's biggest concern, if they convince a customer to sell us their cars, they lose the repair order, right? They don't want to lose the repair order. So what we do is we pay the advisor $100 for every car that we buy that they recommend to the sales department, but we also pay them their full commission on the recon repair order as well. Because that's, that's their biggest concern. And by the way, if you, if you, we all been doing this for a long time. If you look at your statement and you look at your doc, what will you notice? Your, your used car department, generally speaking, including my place, the used car department pays retail labor rates. There's no arguing. And they usually, in a Cadillac store, we spend $1,000 to $1,200 a copy on used cars to recondition them. So there's $100 plus the $1,200 to $1,400 repair order. If you look at the average repair order and dollars per repair order on the average customer pay, it's nowhere near that. So if you educate your advisors to know, hey, listen, we'll give you the 100 bucks plus we'll give you, so I'm acquiring, it's, I, I'd have to pay four or 500 bucks at an auction to buy that car for too much money where I can pay an advisor a hundred bucks to buy it for the right money and comp them on the repair order because I'm going to, we're going to recon the car anyway, right? Yeah. We're going to spend the money anyway. So what is what's, letting him know, Bill, letting him know that, that you're not taking any away from, because you're absolutely right. It's the concept of we're on the same team. Not how many times, Bill, have you seen this? You make a tremendous front end gross, which is what you want because it's real dollars. And the finance guy says, I couldn't get it all bought. Don't worry, I put it on the back end. And if they cancel out or something happens, you got nothing. It's making sure everybody's rowing in the right direction. 100%. Hey, um, hello, guys. Yeah. Hey, hi. Uh, hey, hi. I'm Arun, uh, joining from India. Uh, wow. So, uh, hey, hi. So, uh, I was doing, you know, sales for over... A decade used to sell software products and was into DPO. And I lately you know, started thinking about, uh, you know, starting up a, a car business, uh, maybe in the next two or three years. And as you guys must be aware, like India uh, has a huge potential when it comes to electric cars or the used cars and all those things. But again, you guys are with tons of experience, but I'm completely, you know, a guy who uh, sells software. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to join. And it was uh, you know, amazing listening to all your ideas and thoughts uh, on this event. And 
uh, what I feel was I have recently joined uh, Latent View Analytics. I'm sure uh, I'm not sure you, whether you guys have heard about it. And I have a feel like there are a lot of things that need to analyze when it comes to this particular topic because this is like huge in terms of you know customer uh, identification or even the uh, you know the custom beha behavior. Uh, even the warranty claims, there are, there are plenty, right, in terms of marketing and how we can drive, especially everything is digital nowadays, even the social media research. So uh, this is something great and uh, would, would love to be in touch with you guys, you know, to learn more about it. Uh, Feel free to reach out. Planet. Not a problem. Did you have a question or? No, I just wanted to make, uh, you know, just a statement. So, uh, you know, would be. Uh, love to be in touch with you guys, uh, see what you guys exactly do and multiple things. So it will be a great learning for me as well. We, we, we might be able to speak in person soon. Uh, Ian and Jeff have arranged for a trip to India for me, but somehow they neglected to to book the return passage. I'm, I'm sure it was an oversight. It's on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Arun Raj, um, just, uh, just reach out to us on our website, uh, autohubshow.com. Leave us some information from you. And we can, we'll happily connect you with everybody. Yep, sure. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Hey, Thank hey Sean, did you have a question? Yeah. Looks like you've raised yeah. your hand several times. A couple of times. Everyone's saying great stuff. Uh, I know you said not to compliment you and Bill on the same statement, but I think I'm going to. Uh, you know, I, you know, Bill gives his phone number out to people. Uh, you're saying you have to be human. Troy is saying you have to educate the, the customer in what the dealership is going through. And I think... A big thing, and I, and I can't say this is my idea, but what I've heard lately is if you're going to have them empathize with your situation or what you're going through as a dealer, then you need to empathize with what they're going through as well as a human being. And like that, you know, car prices are much higher and that they have to wait a lot longer. So I think that's the way to kind of like, I'm just echoing everyone's saying about being human, but also empathize with what they're going through. So they feel like they're being seen. And so if you guys can understand both sides of it, I feel like that's helpful in the, in the situation. So that's kind of all I, I you know, really wanted to add. And I, you know, I think the customer is a lot savvier. I know we already touched upon uh, you know, markups, but there's literally a website now called markups.org where uh, a customer made a giant database of every dealership in the country and how far over MSRP they are. Uh, so like people are keen to this now. And so it's how do we, how do we get in front of that? And and you know, understand what they're what they're going through. So I, I just wanted to add that and love what everyone's saying. And for the most part, I haven't heard most of you before. I've heard Larry before, and like everyone says, he's a ball of awesome energy, and I'm fired up now too. But uh, really great to hear everyone else and, and learn from you. So thank you for your, your time. Hey, today. hey, Sean, a couple of things. First, um, if if you want to reach out to me, reach out to me. I'm all over LinkedIn. I like Mr. Bill. I answer my phone all the time. I'd love to speak with what you were quoting and you didn't realize it was Dale Carnegie 101, that you have to show you care about somebody before they'll care about you. Yeah. Um, and don't con yourself into thinking people are all that smart these days. Just go to a Wawa or 7-Eleven and, and stand in front and watch how the door says push and how many people pull. They're as dumb as they ever were, or we wouldn't have the respective leaders we have in our two countries. <laughs> One thing I do have to say, Sean, uh, it was a great point and something I think we've all got to remember in the car industry. I don't know of any other industry other than politics, shh, Larry, shh, um, <laughs> where people actually focus their, waste their lives trying to, trying to do something than car business. Look at somebody, how many hundreds of hours have they wasted compiling a website on dealers charging over MSRP? If they'd have taken that and gone and washed windows on an intersection, they'd have made more money than they ever paid any dealer on markup. <laughs> That's true. And if there's any spots on the windows, call Bill. He likes to get involved from the top down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the, by the way, Larry said he's going to India. I heard Gandhi's moving to Cuba. <laughs> I heard, I heard you, he heard you were coming. Excuse me. Uh, apparently, according to Ocasio Cortez, Cuba is no longer an enemy combatant. So we got to be careful where oh, we're going. I forgot to tell you, Larry, the boat that we booked you on, that's uh, Justin Trudeau's on the boat and, and Joe Biden is, but he don't tell anybody. All right, wait, 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 wait. We've got a lot of brilliant people. So let me ask you a philosophical question. You're on a dock. There's only one life preserver. Both Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau are drowning. Where would you guys have lunch? 
<laughs> Larry, Larry, don't mince words. Tell us how you really feel. All right, here's how I really feel. I'm the funniest guy on this show. You want to get rich? You want to sell cars? You want to get over bullshit, Sean? Make people smile. Put a big smile on your face and say, hey, listen, you couldn't have had a better time to sell your car. And wait to see the deal I get you. Aren't they real high? They are a little higher adjusting for the economy, but I'm going to work a special deal from you. <laughs> Enthusiasm sells, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Good. So, you know, Sean, 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 I want time. Okay. We have a final comment, so go ahead, Bill. I just wanted to, I mean, Sean made a very, very good point. And, and from his perspective, you know, versus our, you know, my perspective, very much saying the same thing. Look, you, you know, if you're going to show empathy for anybody, the word show is the most important word in the sentence, okay? You can't show, put on a show, be at the show without being at the show. So if you're not, if they don't hear your voice, oh, look, I'm, I'm very heavily, heavily invested in the digital space. I do all my own PPC. I do all my own SEO, grassroots videos, you name it. I, and I'm on 10 different pilot programs around the country. Doesn't make me better than anybody else. I do that so I can understand the bridge between the customer and the, the dealership. That's what the technology does. The bridges, years ago, they'd walk in, you know, and Tim remembers this like I do. They'd walk in with a newspaper under their arm. If you sold them what it said in the paper, they'd buy the car from you. Otherwise, they'd shop you, right? Nowadays, they, you got to elevate, elevate the customer through the, through the different la layers of the digital space to live contact. But once you establish that live contact, what do you do next? So what we try to do is we try to make our digital space, our communications, seem as much as we can like live contact with the customer we say things like we've got something really great to tell you about please give me a call or text me at this number i'd, I'd love to share this with you so and that we we elevate them to live contact like you said you cannot show empathy for anybody if you're not communicating with them you can't feel empathy for anybody visibly without them seeing or hearing from you so though we got to we use that technology in that digital space to bring the customer to that place where we can actually show that empathy or give them an explanation. If it makes sense to the customer, they'll swing with it. You got to get their interest first and then you got to get their attention and then you have your live conversation. Once you can do that, you can show them all the things that you just talked about, but getting your people to do that is the biggest challenge. And if you cannot get your people to do that, you got to do it yourself until you can get your people to do that. Otherwise in today's day and age, you can't succeed. That that's my opinion. Last that's my last comment. Okay. Any other comments, Tim? You had some? Well, I was just gonna say, and uh, Bill's just showed us why if we were buying a new Cadillac lyric, we'd be buying it through his store and and already have that ordered. And do you have any on the way yet? Uh, I know you have some on the way, but how many do you have on the way, Bill? I have uh, eight lyrics on the way, and I was part of a pre-order pilot program. We were able to order order fifteen all world Cadillac in their infinite wisdom is gonna give the first eight to every dealer in the Northeast two wheel drive, which makes zero sense. So we're gonna, we, uh, we're get, we have 15 uh, all wheel drives that we've ordered. So eight that are sold and 15 that'll be delivered by the end of the year to people that we don't know yet. I think it'll do as well for you as your Cadillac uh, Escalade eventually. Uh, once they once you get um, somewhere, you can actually show them on your lot. Nick, any final thoughts? Yeah, to uh, Larry's point about therapy, I just want everyone to know that I do have a background in psychiatric nursing and psychosocial rehabilitation. <laughs> I believe it's too late, John. <laughs> so listen, uh, today at, uh, at uh, noon Eastern, we're going to have our, our own little uh, uh, circle here on the Auto Hub show, and we're going to get together, hold hands virtually, and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> with Larry leading us. <laughs> Any other final thoughts from Nick or Troy? You know, I just real quick, I had to buy insurance for my cabin and I walked into uh, an area and I saw a guy that had the logo on his shirt and I said, hey, do you sell insurance? He said, no, I help people buy insurance. And I think it's really the attitude to sum it up is we're not selling cars. We help people buy cars. And right now when cars are hard to buy, now is more important than ever to, to be that person. Nick, any final thoughts? Uh, I think that that was a great uh, 
finish it right there, Troy and uh, and and Bill. You know, I I have a lot of respect for uh, uh, owners and principals that uh, you know really dive in and understand all aspects uh, within their business because I meet a lot of them all day, every day. I do not do that. So it sounds like you're a really good operator, and that's awesome. Good for you. Appreciate it. And if anyone's curious about the metaverse, we're gonna have. Uh... A metaverse show coming up next month and one of the first dealers to deliver a car in the metaverse will be on so stay tuned for that show and have yourself a great week jeff any final thoughts what a great show thanks everybody nick i told you the show took on its own life after a few minutes so uh thank you all for attending i really do appreciate it hopefully you picked up some information all our customers our customers our audiences here we're talking customers so much and uh Tim and Nick, thanks for joining us first time. Bill and Troy, always appreciate it. Larry, as much as I tease you, you're fun to have. And uh, Arujan, uh, uh, Arun Raj, sorry, you've now you are now our have the honor of being our furthest distance uh, joint person. Our previous furthest distance was in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia. So thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Awesome job, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.